Welcome. We are indeed in for a treat today. Um, and if you haven't got enough discussion on Putin, well, I think we're going to hopefully satisfy your curiosity today. Uh, it is our great pleasure to have Karen DeWisha here to talk about her new book, Putin's Kleptocracy, Who Owns Russia? And I should add that the books are available on sale as well. Uh, Karen is the Walter E. Havinghurst Professor of Political Science and director of the Havinghurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies at Miami University in Ohio. Uh, she is a former Wilson Center public policy scholar, as well as a former guest scholar at Brookings. She has taught at many universities, including a long stint in the area at the University of Maryland. Uh, the author of numerous books, but I have a sneaking suspicion that this one really rises to the top of the list. Um, and she received her PhD from the London School of Economics. Uh, Karen will be followed by Professor, Professor Elizabeth Wood uh, for a commentary on her uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Wood is the Professor of Russian and Soviet History at MIT, and Elizabeth also will be joining us in, the, in January as a fellow here. She is the author of two books, including her most recent book, Performing Just, Justice, Agitation Trials in Early Soviet Russia and her current work, uh, which she'll, she will be pursuing here at the center, is also uh, on Vladimir Putin and the performance of power in Russia today. So with that, I turn the floor over to Karen. I'm going to stand. Thank you, Will, and thank you very much to uh, the Kennan Institute and to the Wilson Center, both of whom uh, hosted me when I was here. And I would also like to give a special thanks to the staff in the library who were really terrific in supporting this uh, research. Well, we are in a very interesting period for US-Russian relations or for European-Russian relations. Here we have the most serious crisis since the Cold War, in which one country expanded its territory at the expense of another, and the United States responded quite unusually by putting sanctions against the financial holdings of named individuals close to a certain Russian politician. This doesn't happen every day. We very quickly gained uh, got accustomed to the idea of sanctions. But normally, if we could use that word, normally there should have been some movement of the Sixth Fleet. There should have been some military to military response. There should have been um, more early NATO actions. And we need to think about why is it that they responded with targeted sanctions against individuals and their financial holdings. The reason, I think, is because these sanctions represented a public admission by the United States government of what it had known for over a decade, that Putin has built a system based on massive predation not seen in Russia since the Tsars. Transparency International estimates $300 billion are paid every year in corruption. Capital flight according to official Russian central bank figures since, 19, 2000, since uh, 2005, have been $335 billion. And Credit Suisse last year, in a very important study, not picked up uh, sufficiently in the West, a Credit Suisse, an, an organization that is not exactly devoted to the plight of the poor around the world, issued a report on wealth in Russia. And in that report, it stated that Russia now has the highest income inequality of any country in the world. 110 billionaires control 35% of the entire wealth of this very wealthy country. And before we say, Yes, but GDP per capita has been increasing and all Russians are, are doing better than they used to. They state that the median wealth in Russia, the median, in other words, 50% are richer, 50% are poor, the median wealth in Russia is now only $871. 
It is the lowest median wealth figure of any BRIC country. A country that is a net exporter of energy has a lower median wealth than India. It also now scores below Nigeria in its ability to control corruption and obviously its willingness to control corruption. So what does this mean about what we can say about the Putin system? The Putin system nationalizes the risk and privatizes the reward to loyalists. The pattern we see now of the redistribution of Bashneft to the inner core has been in place since the beginning and even before UCAS. This is not a system in which robber barons create the industrial basis of a robust emerging capitalist economy. This is a system in which barons are robbed by value detracting state rating uh, elites whose sole position is determined by their relationship to the current president. Value detraction is an extremely important part of this picture. Most of the academic world, including myself, have spent the last 20 years focusing on democracy in Russia, on democracy building, on democracy sustaining, on democracy failing, but not on authoritarianism succeeding. And the basic conclusion that I came to in this book is that Russia is not a system under Putin of accidental autocrats. It is a system that was created with a purpose by intelligent design from the very beginning of the Putin regime. I started out with this project with the idea of finding the authoritarian moment. That was the governing uh, idea of, the, of this book. When did they decide what to do what they clearly have done? So I thought 2008. 2004, I went back to 2000 and realized after looking at, mainly at elections, that's what I was interested in at the time, that even the 2000 election was fraudulent. Putin would not have won in the first round without massive fraud. That means that from the very beginning, the Putin project was not a project that was dependent upon trying to win. It was all about guaranteeing the win. Gleb Pavlovsky, whom we all know, was an extremely important member of the PR team around Putin in 2000 and who has fallen out with the Kremlin and vice versa. Um, he has stated, and I agree with this statement, that Putin was part of a, ver quote, a very extensive but politically invisible layer of people who after the end of the 1980s were looking for a revanche in connection with the collapse of the Soviet Union. The argument of the book is that this group failed in 1991, but they succeeded in 2000. It's the same group, ideologically. Not everybody, but ideologically. This group was seeking also to help themselves. They were Andropov trained KGB officers, very interested in economic liberalism, but with political control, and primarily liberalism for them. The book states that the whole story begins in the 1980s. Seeing the collapse of communist rule in Eastern Europe after 1989 and the loss of the ruling status of communist parties there, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union authorized the KGB, and there are documents that are quoted in the book, to move money out of the Soviet Union realizing that if the, if the CPSU lost its ruling status, in other words, access to the state budget without limit, they would need money to live in a multi-party system, something that the Polish, East German, and hung Hungarian parties hadn't thought about. Money started to flood. And it flooded in such amounts that they virtually bankrupt the Gorbachev regime first, and then when Yeltsin failed to find the communist gold, 
they also significantly